In Viking times, a thing was a gathering, a place where leaders and warriors could meet and talk. In the 21st century, our thing is a virtual place, where history academics and enthusiasts from around the world can come together to share knowledge. We're your hosts, Miranda Schmiederer and Lucas Norton. So hold on to your helmets for this episode of that Jorvik Viking Thing podcast. Sigurd the Dragon Slayer had left his beloved Brunhild, but had sworn an oath that he would return and marry her, leaving her a symbol of that promise, the Ring of Andvari, a single piece of the cursed treasure from the Dragon's Hoard. His journey took him across the River Rhine to the lands of King Gyuki, and upon his arrival, folk were astonished at his magnificent appearance, assuming that he was some god from Asgard come to walk among them. When he revealed his identity, the king was eager to invite the legendary dragon slayer to stay at his hall, where Sigurd met the rest of the king's family. He became good friends with the king's three sons, and his daughter, Gudrun. After he had stayed a while, Gudrun asked Sigurd, Noble Sigurd, slayer of Fafnir, your presence in our family's hall is a great honour and source of immense joy for us all. I pray you shall stay a bit longer with us, or are you perhaps planning more adventures abroad? To which Sigurd answered, I must not stay much longer, for my betrothed is waiting for me. Fair Brunhild, wisest of all women. My heart aches with sadness whilst I'm apart from her. Gudrun and her family were saddened by this, but none more so than King Yuki's wife, Queen Grimhild. The queen thought it a shame that such a noble and wealthy man would be leaving them to marry some other woman, whilst her own beautiful daughter, Gudrun, remained unmarried. So when the day of Sigurd's departure approached, she made a sinister scheme. She mixed together a drink for Sigurd, containing the blood of beasts, the might of the earth and sea, burned acorns, boiled pig's guts, as well as the blood of her own child. She served this drink in a horn painted with blood and covered in carved runes, and when Sigurd drank this, it mystically purged all memory of Brunhild from his mind. Then, at Queen Grimhild's request, her eldest son Gunnar asked, Sigurd, we would be honoured if you would stay here with us and join our family. Me and my brother Hogni offer to swear oaths of blood brotherhood with you, and we offer you the hand of our sister, Gudrun, in marriage. To which Gudrun said, Is Sigurd not promised to some other woman, his one true love? But Sigurd, tricked by sorcery, answered, I can think of no woman fairer than you, Gudrun. Of course I shall marry you, and swear blood brotherhood with Gunnar and Hogni. Sigurd, Gunnar and Hogni swore this oath, whilst their youngest brother, Guttorm, was deemed too young to take parts. The wedding between Sigurd and Gudrun took place soon after this, and there were many days of joyous feasting and celebrations. Sigurd, Gudrun, and her brothers had a happy life together in the lands of King Yuki, and Sigurd often led the brothers and their armies to war upon neighbouring lands, winning further fame and glory. Gudrun loved her husband Sigurd very much, and they soon had a son named Sigmund, sharing his name with Sigurd's dead father. Soon after this, Gunnar announced, It is far past time that I was married too, and my mother, Grimhild, has suggested a beautiful noblewoman without equal who is perfect for me. Her name is Brunhild, daughter of Boothly, and I intend to make her my bride. Sigurd, my blood brother, Will you join me on my journey to find her? Sigurd agreed, and together they rode to find this woman, whom Sigurd had no recollection of. When they arrived at her family's lands, they were informed that Brunhild was waiting within her own hall, and that her father and brothers had no say in who she would marry. Brunhild would only marry a man that knew no fear, and she awaited that man within a burning ring of fire. 
Gunnar and Sigurd rode to Brunhild's Hall and saw the inferno which surrounded it on all sides, and Gunnar urged his horse forward, but it refused to approach the flames, so he lamented. Oh, I would gladly jump the fires to prove myself to my bride within the hall, but my horse trembles in terror. Sigurd, may I borrow your magnificent stallion? Sigurd lent him the horse Grani, but that stallion refused to obey Gunnar's instructions to leap through the flames. So Gunnar then revealed that he had knowledge of a devious skill taught to him by his mother, the sorceress Grimhild, declaring, I know of a spell that will allow you and I to swap appearances, Sigurd. Your brave horse Grani only obeys you, and it would surely jump through the flames with you upon its back. Would you do me this favour, blood brother? Ride Grani through the flames disguised as myself. Meet with Brunhild, announce that Gunnar, son of Giuki, was fearless enough to ride through her ferocious fires. Sigurd agreed reluctantly to Gunnar's request, and then he climbed aboard Grani's back with the sword Gram in his hand and golden spurs upon his feet. With just a gentle prick from the spurs, Grani obeyed his master, riding towards the inferno and leaping into the flames. The earth shook as he passed through, and the fire surged upwards into the sky. Within the flames, it strangely seemed to be as dark and empty as Ganunga Gap. But then, Sigurd, disguised as Gunnar, emerged from the other side and entered the golden-roofed hall. The woman within was confused and asked, Who is this bold man who enters my hall? To which Sigurd answered, My name is Gunnar, son of Guki. I've ridden fearlessly through the burning ring of fire, and now you shall become my wife. Brunhild was shocked and said, I do not know how I should respond to this. She then sat silently in her seat, like a swan upon a wave, dressed in mail and a helmet with a sword in her hand. She looked down at Andvari's ring on her finger, and eventually she spoke. Gunnar, do not talk this way unless you truly are better than all other men in all the world and can be counted upon to slay every other man that has ever sought to make me marry them. I have reddened my blade in many battles, and I still long for that life. But Sigurd said, You have accomplished much, Brunhild, but you swore an oath that you would marry the fearless man who rode through the flames. That man is me, Gunnar. Brunhild knew that she had sworn this oath, so she let him stay a while at the hall. For three nights Sigurd stayed there, disguised as Gunnar, and they shared one bed together, though he placed his sword between them. He offered her a new ring from Fafnir's treasure hoard as a symbol of the betrothal between Brunhild and Gunnar, but he exchanged it for the ring of Andvari, unaware that he himself had once given her that ring at the summit of Hinderfjall as a symbol of the oaths he and Brunhild had sworn to one another. After this, Sigurd departed to meet Gunnar, both reverting to their original appearances. Whilst Brunhild rushed to meet her foster father, Heimir, to whom she confided her troubled thoughts, revealing, This man named Gunnar rode through my burning ring of fire to propose to me, but I was sure that Sigurd was the only man in the world who was capable of such a bold deed. I swore oaths for Sigurd at the peak of the mountain, and he became my first lover. Life and love seemed so simple then, but perhaps love blinded me when I met Sigurd, as this Gunnar must be the superior man, completely lacking in fear. When he lay with me in my bed, I felt like he was not a stranger to me. So perhaps I am destined to marry Gunnar, son of Gyrki. And then she whispered to her foster father, Sigurd does not know that he left me with more than a ring and broken promises. It would be for the best that neither he nor my new husband learnt that she exists. I shall leave Aslaug with you, foster father. And so, it came to pass that through sorcery and manipulation, Sigurd and Brunhild found themselves married to the children of King Yuki and Queen Grimhild. Brunhild resided with her new husband Gunnar at King Yuki's residence, near to where Sigurd and his wife Gudrun lived. But soon, 
problems and conflicts began to emerge between the two couples. Firstly, the effects of the elixir of forgetfulness eventually wore off, and Sigurd remembered all that he had forgotten, though he chose not to say anything, for both he and Brunhild were now married, and he had no desire to dishonour either Gudrun or Gunnar, despite the love he felt for Brunhild. But Brunhild, of course, was unaware that she had been deceived into believing that Gunnar was the greatest and boldest of men, which led her to act with arrogance and pride, provoking arguments with the other women. On one occasion, Gudrun asked Brunhild, Why do you behave like this? You mock us, mistreat us, and act with arrogance. You act as if you're better than me and the other women here. To which Brunhild arrogantly answered, I act like this because I am better than you, Gudrun. My father is better than yours, and my husband Gunnar is far superior to Sigurd. Your husband was raised practically as a slave at King Al's court, while Gunnar is the bravest man in all of the world, for only he had the courage and skill to leap through the Ring of Fire. Gudrun was infuriated by Brunhild's prideful words, so she angrily responded, Do not mock my husband. He has accomplished far greater deeds than Gunnar ever did. It was Sigurd who slew the dragon Fafnir, and it was truly Sigurd who leapt through your ring of fire. Brunhild scoffed at Gudrun's words, saying, I, I don't believe these lies. But Gudrun then revealed the proof that had been in plain sight all along. Look, Brynhild, at the ring that I wear. This is the ring of Andvari that Sigurd once gave to you. It was not Gunnar who took it from you, but Sigurd, disguised as Gunnar. And he then gave it to me, his wife. Gunnar did not leap through the fire, it was Sigurd. The bravest man there is, was, or ever shall be. Your husband deceived you. Brynhild recognised the ring, And now that she understood what had happened, she turned as pale as death. She spoke to no one for the rest of that day, and everyone was greatly troubled by her wistful behaviour. The next day, Gudrun spoke with Brunhild, saying, I bear no malice to you, Brunhild. We've both been manipulated, but why can we not both make do with what we've been given? We are both married to wonderful men and live comfortable lives here. Can anything be done to make you happy again? But Brunhild coldly responded, You have no right to enjoy Sigurd, nor the treasures of Fafnir the dragon. It was well known that Sigurd and I swore oaths to one another, yet your family stole him and made us oath breakers. I swear there will be dire consequences for the way that I have been treated. Brunhild refused to leave her bed for a long time, so great was the grief and fury within her heart. When her husband Gunnar asked her what was wrong, she answered, The problem is that I am married to you and not Sigurd. You are no true king and no champion. Sigurd is the one that I love, the bravest man in all the world, whilst you are a coward who turned as pale as a corpse at the thought of passing through the flames around my hall. Brunhild then raised herself out of bed and tried to kill her husband Gunnar, but his brother Hogni restrained her and put her in chains to stop her from harming anyone, much to Gunnar's dismay, who said, I have no desire for my wife to live in chains. But she bitterly said, Don't worry about my suffering. If I were free, you would never see me happy or cheerful again in your hall. Keep the doors to my room open, as I wish everyone to hear my wails and learn of the terrible grief inflicted upon me. Everyone was aware of Brunhild's agonising, hellish sadness, for she wailed and screamed constantly, with no one able to comfort her. This went on for many days, and caused Sigurd to say to Gudrun, I have a bad feeling that this sadness will turn into something far larger. I think Brunhild is going to die. To which Gudrun answered, Husband, many strange things happen where that woman is concerned. I asked my brother Gunnar to speak with her and tell her that I feel pity for her in her grief. But he says that she has forbidden him from talking to her. 
He told me that she has slept for seven days and no one has dared wake her up. And Sigurd suggested, Brunhild is not sleeping. She plots our downfall. Gudrun was worried by this and told Sigurd, Brynhild will be the cause of your death, dear husband. I'm filled with horror at this thought. Go meet with her. Offer her any treasure she wishes, anything to buy peace and soften her anger. Sigurd went to where Brunhild lay and was greeted with great hostility as she said, You are bold to come to me, Sigurd, Oathbreaker. No one has betrayed me worse than you. It was not Gunnar who came to me in my hall. It was you, and you deceived me. You were familiar to me, and I thought this stranger Gunnar had your eyes. But I failed to see the truth, as if there was some foul curse upon my luck. Sigurd responded, But I am no better than Gunnar. He is a renowned warrior who has accomplished many great deeds of his own. Brunhild scoffed at his answer, saying, It was you, Sigurd, who slew Fafnir. It was you who rode through the ferocious flames about my hall. No son of Gyrki accomplished any deed as great as those. The sight of Gunnar has never made my heart smile. So many miseries have been inflicted upon me by yours and Gunnar's lies. But the worst of my miseries is that I cannot devise a way to redden my bitter sharp sword in your blood, Sigurd. You have cheated me out of all joy. I do not wish to live any longer. Sigurd sadly responded. Please, Brynhild, choose to live. Live and love Gunnar, and I shall give you everything I own. No price is too small if it will prevent your death, as I love you more than I love myself. I was tricked too, but nothing can be changed about that now. Even though when I regained my memories, I regretted that you were not my wife. Brunhild answered. Your sorrows and regrets for my misery are too late, Sigurd. I will accept no repayment from you. Sigurd wistfully said, I wish that the two of us could go into the same bed and you could be my wife. But this only angered Brunhild further, who said, Don't you dare talk like that. I will not dishonour myself further by betraying my husband. You have ruined everything, Sigurd. And now I don't want to live. I don't want you, and I don't want anyone else. Sigurd sadly replied, I would rather leave Gudrun and marry you than see you die. His chest swelled with such sorrow that his male shirt burst, and then he left. Later, Gunnar went to Brunhild, and she coldly said to him, Sigurd betrayed me, and he betrayed you no less when you let him share a bed with me for three nights. I was no virgin when I married you, Gunnar. What are you going to do about this? Are you going to preserve what little honour you have left? I demand that you kill Sigurd. Do as I ask, or I swear I shall divorce you, and I will ensure that you lose everything you rule and all that you own, and then you shall lose your life too. Gunnar was shocked by his wife's words, but answered, The knowledge that Sigurd, my own blood brother, could do such a thing fills my heart with sorrow and anger. I will do as you ask, Brunhild. To which Brunhild spitefully added, And whilst you're at it, kill his son too. I don't want that wolf pup raised in our home. Gunnar met with his brother Hogni and said, It seems I must kill Sigurd, for he has betrayed my trust and dishonoured me. If Sigurd remains alive, then my wife Brunhild will divorce me and I can think of no greater shame. Hogni was intrigued at the prospect of seizing all of the dragon's treasure that Sigurd now owned, but was concerned as the three of them were blood brothers. Gunnar, however, suggested, Whilst you and I swore oaths of blood brotherhood with Sigurd, our youngest brother Guttorm did not. Now he is a man grown and has sworn no allegiance to Sigurd. Let him be the instrument of Sigurd's demise. Gunnar and Hogni met with Guttorm and urged him to murder Sigurd. He seemed reluctant, so they made use of their mother Grimhild's sorcery to mix an enchanted drink of wolf flesh and snake meat 
and when Guthorm consumed it, he was overcome with wild, aggressive behaviour and swore he would slaughter Sigurd. Guthorm went to where Sigurd slept peacefully, but when he looked at Sigurd's face, he found his courage left him, so he ran away. He tried to commit his bloody deed a second time, but was frightened once again, for he caught a glimpse of Sigurd's eyes, filled with serpent-like brightness. Finally, the third time he came into Sigurd's room, he struck, stabbing him with his sword with such strength that he pierced the mattress and bed beneath him. Sigurd awoke in great pain and saw his killer standing over him. Then, with all the strength he could muster, he grabbed the sword Gram that lay next to him, and he threw it at Guthorm as that murderer ran for the door. The enchanted sword was so sharp that it sliced Guthorm clean in half at the waist, with his legs and hips stumbling forwards, whilst his head and torso slumped backwards. Gudrun came rushing in to find her brother dismembered on the floor and her husband impaled and bleeding to death, and then filled with bewilderment and grief, she said. My brothers have killed my husband. How could they do this to me? Did they not realise that Sigurd was the source of their luck and triumph in battle? I fear my brother shall find victory no longer, and I am now doomed to more grief and mourning. Gudrun screamed in agonising sorrow, and when Brunhild heard this wail of heartbreak, she began to laugh. But then, for reasons she could not understand, she began to cry, and no one knew why Brunhild wept in what seemed like her moment of triumph. Gunnar asked her, Why do you weep? I have done exactly as you asked, so I presumed you would now be joyous. I thought you hated Sigurd. To which Brunhild answered, I hated him almost as much as I loved him. That is the source of my hellish pain. She then glared with fury at Gunnar and proclaimed, You and your brother Hogni have broken your oaths of blood brotherhood with Sigurd, repaying all his good with nothing but evil. Now that dragon's cursed treasure belongs to you and it shall be your doom. Your luck shall leave you now, Gunnar, and I have nothing left to live for. Gunnar begged Brunhild to live, but to no avail. She ordered that all of her wealth be brought to her, and she offered it freely to anyone who wanted some share of it. And then she picked up her sword and stabbed herself through her own heart. As she lay dying, she summoned Gunnar and said, I have one last request, husband. Make a great funeral pyre for me and Sigurd. Place a blood-reddened tent above it all, and burn me side by side with Sigurd, with his sword between us, just as it was when we were pledged to become husband and wife. Make this funeral a mighty spectacle, remembered for all time. Burn all the others who died as a result of our actions, and have five slave women and eight slave men killed to serve Sigurd, and follow him to whatever comes next. The funeral pyre was prepared as she ordered, and Brunhild and Sigurd the Dragon Slayer lay together, peacefully as the flames rose higher and consumed what remained of them. In this life, these lovers were fated to never be together, but perhaps in death they were united and would finally be together in Valhalla. As if I would let that treacherous Valkyrie back into Valhalla. Sigurd now resides in my hall in Asgard, whilst Brunhild travels on the road down deep into Helheim where she belongs. Had you forgotten about me? Yes, you there listening to this tragic saga. Do you think I treated the Volsungs unfairly? Do you think the judgment of Odin is cruel? Why should I care what some ignorant humans think of me? The wolf does not concern itself with the opinions of sheep. All that I have done to the Volsons is for the benefit of us all, for the greater good. 
That family of heroes now fights for me amongst the Einherjar, the warriors of Valhalla. And now with Sigurd the Dragon Slayer amongst their ranks, there is a chance that Ragnarok might be averted. All the men of this line are now dead, ending the line of the Volsun family. I declare that the saga of the Volsuns has ended. Odin was right, that all the men of the great family of Volsung were gone, and there would never again be another dynasty like this in all the world. But Odin was also wrong, for he had missed one member of the family, small and inconsequential to his grand cosmic plans. A young girl named Aslaug, the secret daughter of Sigurd and Brunhild, safely hidden away by Brunhild's foster father. This girl would marry a great prince, a bold dragon slayer, famed for his hairy trousers, and together they would begin a new line of heroes, continuing the bloodline of Volsung. But that is a saga for another day. If you liked this episode and want to learn more about the Vikings, then come visit Jorvik Viking Center, where you can enjoy the sights, sounds, and smells of the Viking Age. You can book your tickets at jorvikvikingcenter.co.uk. Don't forget to rate and review that Jorvik Viking Thing podcast on your podcast app. And if you enjoyed the show, share us with a friend. It's the best way to help support your favorite history podcast. To contact us for more information or ideas for future episodes, you can email us on podcast at yorkat.co.uk. Thanks for listening to that Jorvik Viking Thing podcast. You can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and all other major podcast platforms. That Jorvik Viking Thing podcast is a production of the Jorvik Group and York Archaeology, hosted by Miranda Schmiederer and Lucas Norton. Researched by Lucas Norton, produced by Miranda Schmiederer, Lucas Norton and Gareth Henry. Sound designed and edited by Miranda Schmiederer.